when we talk about non-infectious causes of fever, we have to define what do we mean by a fever. And actually, um, a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, can be found uh, in, in some form in the Infectious Disease Society guidelines on evaluating fever in critically ill patients. Um, so we have to start with a baseline definition of fever, and we're going to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of fever. I'm going to give you that obligatory list of the non-infectious causes. And then what I, what I wanted to do was to uh, highlight some of these non-infectious causes of fever by going through a series of cases that were seen on the Infectious Disease Consult Service at the VA Medical Center. Um, and, you know, I just want you to gain an appreciation for how complicated it can be sometimes to dissect out what part of the fever is coming from an infection and what part is coming from another etiology. Um, and then we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about some potential markers of infection and rapid diagnostic methods that may be used in the future to help us tease out what's infectious, what's non-infectious, and then I'll give you, you know, sort of my concluding pearls and a few references. So here's our learning objectives. Just by the end of this, you should be able to name several causes, non-infectious causes of fever in ICU patients. And I should also add that anything that I say today that pertains to ICU patients obviously pertains to non-ICU patients as well as patients you might see in an outpatient setting. Um, also to identify some rapid and specific tests that can be used to uh, detect pathogens where culture methods are not um, uh, amenable and also appreciate that these non-infectious causes of fever can coexist with infectious causes and that contributes to the complexity of the diagnosis. I have no disclosures that are relevant today's, to today's presentation. So without further ado. Um, so first of all, getting to this idea of what is a fever. Um, as you know, uh, it, you know, it's sort of like, uh, I, I, I'm going to sound like Dr. Bonomo now, but uh, it's like pornography. You recognize it when you see it, but there is really a difficult legal definition of what that is. And the same thing is true with fever. We see a patient and we think that there's, you know, it's pretty obvious when a patient has a fever, but it's not always clear. Really, it isn't. Um, and, and it starts out in our guidelines that I just mentioned. Um, the, the lead author says the definition of fever is arbitrary and depends on the purpose for which it's defined. And that, that really is true because there are people that have fevers that don't have infections. There are people that have infections who don't have fevers. And so using fever as a basis for deciding whether someone has an infection or not is, is pretty difficult. However, um, in order to do any kind of study or establish any kind of guidelines, in general, it's accepted that a temperature of 38.3 or higher is considered a fever. And those patients, especially when they're critically ill, warrant some sort of special attention and evaluation. Um, exceptions to the rule, immunocompromised patients, people who are elderly who are probably also have some immune senescence, patients that have large abdominal wounds or burns where they're having evaporative loss that actually lowers their temperature. So they may, they may be hypothermic most of the time. Um, patients who are receiving ECMO, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or continuous renal replacement therapy, patients that have heart, liver, or kidney failure, or are already on anti-inflammatory or antipyretic drugs. So, you know, it's, we always think it's a great thing to write that PRN order for Tylenol for a fever, but really it messes up our ability to interpret when a patient has a fever, what kind of fever they're having. So it's probably best to leave that off. All right. Pathophysi I, I don't know how many of you in the audience remember Peggy Lee, but I could guess probably about half of you do. <laughs> um, so, Fever is not a bad thing. I think in the hospital we tend to react, you know, in this kind of knee-jerk way, culture, throw on antibiotics, try to figure out where the fever is coming from. But really, fever is a very important normal response of the innate immune system, and it's, it's the way the host is trying to get rid of pathogens. Um, and it's primarily mediated by the release of specific oops, cytokines, IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, and these bind to certain regions in the hypothalamus that then sets off the cyclooxygenase cascade. And that's why you can think about 
NSAIDs and aspirin and how they mediate fever, and it's directly through the, the blockage of the cyclooxygenase enzymes. There are also some cytokines that will allow the release of prostaglandin E2, and this is a molecule that can actually bind to specific neurons in the CNS and cause fever through that mechanism. So fever, fever is actually a good thing. All right, so these are these guidelines that I've mentioned a couple times already. Evaluation of new fever in critically ill adult patients from the IDSA. Um, and they give a list of fever related to other therapies and non-infectious inflammatory states. So fever is really more a hallmark of inflammation than anything else. And infections obviously cause inflammation, and we always have to worry about those. But anything that causes inflammation from acalculus cholecystitis to blood product transfusion, we see that quite often. Um, drug fever, which we'll highlight. Actually, I might as well just go through that. We're going we're to talk about some specific examples. Drug fever, gout, stroke, venous thrombosis, myocardial infarction, all as examples of um, things that can cause fever that are not necessarily infectious. Right, here's another list that comes from a publication by Paul Merrick, an intensivist in the D.C. area. Um, pretty much the same list. You know, it's, it's eight years later in the IDSA guidelines, but things haven't changed too much. Um, so I'm going to start. I, I'm a lumper, so I like to kind of group things together as opposed to splitting them apart. And I'm going to, I'm going to start each of the set of clinical vignettes by actually coming together, bringing together some different notions about what can cause fever in a non-infectious manner. And so I've, I've got this sort of general rubric of drug fever, and under this I've listed a couple of things that you might not classically consider as drug fever, but if you think about it, uh, they, they all sort of fall under this general heading. Malignant hyperthermia is something that as, in, as internal medicine physicians we generally don't see. This is something that the uh, anesthesiologist would see in the operating room, but it's caused by um, excessive release of calcium into muscles and muscle contractions, and this is actually a genetic condition um, that can be tested for in patients prior to receiving anesthesia. So what we know now is that there are certain individuals that have polymorphisms in the ryanidine uh, channel. It's a calcium-sensitive calcium channel in uh, in skeletal muscle, and when you administer uh, inhaled anesthetics or succinylcholine during anesthesia, you can get this tremendous release of calcium into muscles, and there's contraction, and this can be fatal uh, if it's not recognized and reversed with uh, a blocker of that ryanidine channel. So that's, that is an example, in, in my way of thinking about it, of a drug fever that can occur with the administration of volatile anesthetics. Um, the case that I'm going to talk about today is, is the second one, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, so I'll just skip over that for a minute. But when we talk about drug fever classically, we're talking about fever that occurs um, in association with administration of certain drugs. Uh, notably, antibiotics and anticonvulsants are probably the biggest culprits in this case. And classically, this has been described as a triad of fever, rash, and eosinophilia, and kind of represents an early hypersensitivity reaction to a drug. It's typically noted seven to ten days after a drug is administered. And usually what happens is the patient has very high temperatures, um, sort of in that 39 range or about 102, and they look clinically well. So they, this might have been a patient who had an infection, got treated with a beta-lactam antibiotic, for example, and then after they're doing clinically better, suddenly develops a fever and, and for all the world looks like they're very clinically stable otherwise. So this is something very important to keep in mind. Um, and then sort of a, another extreme is where you have certain drugs that cause hypersensitivity reactions that have more dermatologic findings. These are idiopathic, um, like Stevens-Johnson's with anticonvulsants, where you can actually go on to desquamate and you can have fever in this setting as well. Okay, so this is from a recent review on drug fever, and this is just a, a nice list of all the different ki kinds of drugs that can cause drug fever. So antimicrobial drugs are hi highlighted up here. They're um, the 
the particular ones that I mentioned before, the beta-lactams are probably the biggest culprits. Um, and then you have everything from anti-neoplastic agents, cardiovascular agents, immunosuppressant drugs, even NSAIDs can cause drug fever. Um, anticonvulsants are represented here, antidepressants, and then a whole range of other drugs, um, things that we use to treat gout, for example, allopurinol might be a good example. And these drugs can cause fever in a multitude of ways. So they may interfere with peripheral heat dissipation. For example, things that are anticholinergic agents may prevent you from sweating. Um, you may have alteration of CNS temperature regulation by CNS active drugs like anticonvulsants or um, exogenous pyrogenicity, things like amphotericin or vancomycin where you're actually uh, in some cases even causing histamine release and, and causing a temperature elevation in that setting. So the first patient we're going to consider is a gentleman who was recently started on Zyprazidone, uh, which is also called Geodon as a trade name. It's an atypical antipsychotic. Um, he developed fever and, as you'll see, rhabdomyolysis and acute renal failure. He was 47 years old. He was actually a resident of the um, Brecksville Psychiatric Facility. He was found down at the facility. He was somnolent, unable to follow any simple commands. He was hypotensive, and he had a temperature of 39.4. He had come into the hospital six days earlier for a decompensation of his schizoaffective disorder, and at that time had received a dose of Haldol. He was already on lithium and valproic acid, and he actually had his lithium increase slightly because he was subtherapeutic on, on uh, initial presentation. And they started ziprazidone. And this, there is an indication in patients who have acute mania to initiate uh, uh, this agent, this atypical antipsychotic. So uh, because of his physical findings and his, his um, uh, decreased mental status, he was actually transferred to the MICU here at University Hospitals. He was intubated, started on pressors and fluids. He started on broad-spectrum antibiotics. They were even so concerned that he was presenting with a sepsis picture that they gave him activated protein C, which we don't do very often in patients anymore. Um, and when, when he came in, his labs were notable for a leukocytosis to 20. He had a markedly elevated CPK of 24,000, and a troponin was also elevated. And his, all his electrolytes were, were off whack. His serum sodium was 161, and his K was about 6. His creatinine was elevated, and he also had a lithium level of 2. And I've summarized that on, on the following slide. So this blue tracing actually is his temperature uh, that was that I gathered from um, uh, the medical records and from when he was transferred back to the VA hospital. So here in the beginning is where he receives the ziprazidone, where this red arrow is, and pretty much after that he can, you know, he presented with the hypotension and the somnolence and the high fever, and then was noted to have the leukocytosis and CPK elevation. Here he gets uh, this yellow arrow represents the initiation of his broad-spectrum antibiotics. So he received piptazo, vancomycin, activated factor 7, or protein C, and normal saline hydration. And then pretty quickly, I think the team recognized that this might not be sepsis, that this had something to do with the initiation of the ziprazidone. And he was administered bromocryptine, and then pretty much after that, his temperature dropped, although I recognize he was still continued on his antibiotic, broad-spectrum antibiotic therapy. The factor, the activated factor um, 7 was discontinued. So he did, he did quite well after that. He eventually went to the ward, got transferred back to the VA over here, and then had a brief um, readmission into uh, the MICU at, at the VA because he developed fever, some strider, and they actually found that due to the intubation he had had previously, he had sloughed off some of his tracheal mucosa into the lung and developed an infiltrate. So here he develops a fever that's probably somewhat infectious in nature. And then again, later on the ward, he develops a urinary tract infection with a pretty resistant E. coli and has another respectable fever. So this is an example of a patient, you know, who's had three fevers over the course of a hospitalization. The initial one 
probably can be attributed to the ziprazidone and to a neuroleptic malignant syndrome presentation. But then you can see that for all the world, you can't tell whether his fever is coming from an infection or not, right? Here he has some true documented infections, and the fever looks the same. In the end, he did well. He was discharged on a regimen of thiothixine and valproic acid, and they tried to avoid the atypical antipsychotics in him. So he responded to this supportive care and to bromocryptine, and the final diagnosis in the chart, at least, was that he had developed neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So what is neuroleptic malignant syndrome? This is a life-threatening disorder caused by an adverse reaction to neuroleptic or antipsychotic drugs, and this is typically seen with drugs that have a very high dopaminergic activity. The patient typically will present with muscle rigidity, which this patient didn't necessarily have, high fevers, autonomic instability, cognitive changes such as delirium, which he did exhibit, and it's also elevated with this very high CPK. So in the current definition of NMS that's in the DSM, he would actually fit the definition of neuroleptic malignant syndrome, although he did lack the muscle rigidity, but he's got five out of the six criteria. Actually, the incidence of this has declined, probably because it's more recognized, especially among psychiatrists, and they're very careful with this administration. But it is still something to consider when you are treating a patient with especially the atypical antipsychotics. Usually what happens is that if you just remove the drug and then administer something that will actually cause dopamine to be released again, then you'll be fine, and that's really the role of the bromocryptine in this case. So the fever, the acronym that's given here is fever, encephalopathy, unstable vital signs, elevated enzymes, the CPK, and rigidity of muscles, just to help you remember NMS. There's also been some more recent research to look to see, because it's been observed that this can run in families, whether there are any particular genetic determinants to help you decide whether someone will be susceptible to NMS or not. And as you can imagine, polymorphisms in the dopamine receptor and the serotonin receptor, and actually in the cytochrome that's responsible for the metabolism of many of these drugs, have been associated with NMS. But they still need to do additional studies that are better powered. Okay. So moving along to another kind of broad category of diseases that are associated with fever, we have the rheumatologic diseases. And here I just listed a few things. We're going to talk about a patient who has a presentation of gout. Also, patients with a variety of vasculitides can present with fever. Hereditary fevers, such as familial Mediterranean fever, have fever in their name, so you know that those are fever-related things. And then again, drugs that are used to treat rheumatologic diseases, such as methotrexate, the anti-malarial drugs, can often be associated with fever. So the next patient we're going to consider is a gentleman who eventually presented with sort of a polyarthritis fever and leukocytosis. But his hospitalization started when he had actually had a scrotal abscess. So he has a past history of prostate cancer. He also has antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. He's on warfarin for this and a history of gout. So he had been admitted to the hospital with a scrotal abscess that was drained surgically, and then he was discharged on oral trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, or Bactrim. He came back on postoperative day five with hypotension, a leukocytosis. He endorsed that he had not completed his antibiotics at home, no surprise. But when they examined him, his scrotum appeared completely normal. He had no inflammation, no fluctuants, no tenderness. But because he was so ill-appearing with the hypotension and leukocytosis, they admitted him to the ICU for sepsis. He was pan-cultured, and presumably these cultures were obtained off antibiotics because he said he hadn't been taking his antibiotics at home. And then he was given 
vancomycin and, and uh, piperacillin and tazobactam, the cultures all came back negative. At the time, he was also noted to have a very high erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein, um, and there was nothing really obvious on his examination to account for this. So uh, the, the team entertained the diagnosis of endocarditis as a possibility because he had the hypotension, the leukocytosis, and this very high sed rate in CRP. So they did a surface echo, and that, that was an unrevealing test. So again, here's a, a graph of his temperature curve over the time that he's in the hospital. And then in the yellow, we have his white count. So the lowest value is about a 10, the highest is about a 20. Um, so we, we see him now, after he's been in the ICU, he's actually on the ward, he's still having some, some fevers uh, on this on post-operative day five. He's still on these very broad spectrum antibiotics, but still having fever. And they, I guess they got a culture of the wound, and it, it just grew a, a strep species, which wasn't of any significance. And then about day 11, he starts to have this polyarticular pain in knees, ankles, wrists. And he was seen by the rheumatology service who thought he was having a flare of gout, and they recommended giving him prednisone. And this, they, they based this both on his clinical presentation and the fact that he had this unexplained elevation in his sed rate and CRP. Um, he, he had been switched already to oral antibiotics at this point with anticipation that he might be going home soon. And then he spiked a fever despite being on all these antibiotics and starting prednisone. And this is really when his joint symptoms started to manifest right here. He got uh, recultured with the presence of this fever, but he's on, on many, many antibiotics as you can appreciate. And they, they're, again, so concerned that they haven't determined the cause of the fever in this elevated sed rate in CRP that a TEE is performed. Again, trying to uh, tie this all together to a diagnosis of endocarditis. But cultures are negative, uh, TEE is negative, and they, don't have, they still don't have a good explanation other than the fact that he appears to have gout. He starts to improve with the prednisone, presumably, and after all his cultures are negative, his sed rate starts to come down, his fever disappears, um, and he, he generally feels better in terms of his joint presentation. The final conclusion is that he had a gout flare. It may not have been what initially brought him into the hospital, but it was certainly precipitated uh, during the course of his hospitalization and accounted for the fever that occurred at this point. So he continued to do well, as I said, got tapered from his steroids, and then was sent out on allopurinol and colchicine. So the final diagnosis was a gout flare. So again, I just want to highlight this idea that sometimes it's really hard to decide whether a patient is having an infection or whether another process that is non-infectious is contributing to the overall clinical picture in the fever. So. Uh, again, this was, this was just the final diagnosis as determined by the ID service and the uh, rheumatology service. But it, it points out the fact that we have a whole series of auto-inflammatory diseases, gout being one of them, that can cause fever. And this is actually from a very nice review that was in Nature Clinical Practice Rheumatology that talks about this, this entity that's found in monocytic cells called the inflammasome. Basically, uh, this is part of the innate immune system, and in these cells we have extracellular toll-like receptors that will bind ligands that are, you know, things like endotoxin, um, various uh, other inflammatory mediators in the, in the uh, bloodstream, and if they bind to the extracellular side, to the toll-like receptors, you can activate NF-kappa B, which eventually will lead to the, the synthesis of um, the pro-molecule of interleukin-1 beta. And as we mentioned before, interleukin-1 is one of the primary mediators of fever. On the inside of the cell, you have what are called nod-like nod receptors. And there's one that's specifically been implicated in gout called NALP3. And what happens is the gout crystals make their way into the cell and they bind to this portion of the nod receptor, 
And this causes a conformational change in the entire receptor unit that allows this assembly of many, many proteins. And this assembly, this inflammasome, actually activates an enzyme called caspase, which cleaves pro-IL-1-beta into its active form of IL-1-beta. And that's then the inflammatory mediator that leads to fever. So it's just interesting to note that a lot of different ligands, bacterial RNA, endotoxin, mitochondrial toxins, as well as uric acid crystals, can actually start the process in the intracellular NOD receptors and lead to inflammation. So this is presumably how gout and fever are linked. Another big category that we see often in infectious diseases are patients with malignancy who have fever. And, of course, patients with malignancies often have infections, and arguably that may be the reason why most people with malignancies succumb eventually, is because of an overwhelming infection. But the presence of the malignancy itself can cause inflammation. And we have these notions of things like tumor fever or neutropenic fever. And in this case, when patients are neutropenic, about half the time we actually never identify a specific infectious agent that's implicated in causing the fever. So the fact that the patient is neutropenic in and of itself may actually contribute to fever. And then, of course, we have the ubiquitous drug fever, antineoplastic agents that are used in treating malignancy, as well as the many antibiotics that are used when patients are immunocompromised, all contribute to non-infectious causes of fever. So this is a very complicated patient that we'll go over, who during the course of his hospitalization has infectious causes of fever, but then remains persistently febrile while neutropenic, and despite not finding any other etiology and despite being on very broad spectrum coverage, including antifungals. So this is a case where, again, I don't want to imply that there is no infectious cause to his fever, but it's a case that illustrates many of the possible things that can go on in these very complicated patients that may be contributing to their fever besides infection. So this was a 60-year-old man who had myelodysplastic syndrome that was becoming a leukemia. And he came in originally for a Broviac placement because they were planning on doing chemotherapy with cytarabine and idorubicin. So following the administration of these agents, he became neutropenic on the 12th day of his hospitalization, and pretty much, you know, he read the neutropenic fever textbook. The first thing that usually happens to patients when they become neutropenic is they have sloughing of their GI tract, they develop things like neutropenic enterocolitis, and he developed a gram-negative bacteremia as a result of the sloughing of his GI tract. So this is a pretty typical thing that happens. So clearly an infectious agent causing his fever. He was on antibiotics at the time that were appropriate for the Citrobacter freundiae, and then during the course of his further hospitalization, he developed shortness of breath, nodular infiltrates that were thought perhaps to be representative of septic emboli, and he eventually was transferred to the ICU. So this is one of his early CAT scans, and you can see there's pretty diffuse infiltrates, a little more on the left than on the right, but all these little nodular areas were what were of concern. So I apologize for the busyness of the slide, and this is summarized again on my fever curve that I'll show you in just a second. But basically the thought was that he might be having septic emboli, so his Broviac was removed, and it was cultured in the micro lab. It didn't show any growth of any particular organisms, including fungal organisms. His shortness of breath worsened, so eventually he was intubated. He was started on voriconazole, which is an antifungal agent that will cover 
aspergillosis, which is a consideration in these patients. And then there was also a concern that he might have pneumocystis infection, so he was started on Bactrim as well. And at the time, a serum galactamannan test was sent on the patient. And we'll talk a little bit about this as a sort of a surrogate marker of aspergillus infection in just a moment. They performed a BAL because in addition to being neutropenic, he was thrombocytopenic. They didn't want to get a tissue biopsy at this point. But the BAL was negative for any kind of bacteria, mycobacteria, fungi. They also did a silver stain looking for pneumocystis, and they did some viral antigen panels and viral cultures, which were negative. During this time, they also took a look at his bone marrow again, and despite having had the idorubicin and cytarabine, he still had blasts in his bone marrow, so he had not responded to his chemo. He eventually became even worse with multi-organ system failure, but then sort of improved with a little bump in his neutrophil count, and eventually got extubated, off pressors, and then was sent off to the ward to await a decision about whether they were going to do any further chemotherapy, and also to complete a course of antibiotics for presumed hospital-acquired pneumonia, neutropenic fever. His serum galactomannan result returns like a week later, and it's negative. Then on the 29th day of his hospitalization, he represents with diarrhea. He gets started on oral vancomycin. They send a C. diff antigen test. It's negative, but he's continued on the oral vancomycin for presumptive C. diff. And then about a week later, he's again having worsening respiratory distress. They get another CAT scan that shows worsening of the nodular process in his lung. He gets back on all these, well, he's been on all these antibiotics throughout his hospital course, despite that. Okay, this is just a, this was that CT of the chest that I showed just a few minutes ago in the beginning, and then this is the worsening of this nodular process now with an effusion on the left side. Okay. All right. This is a busy slide. This just summarizes all his antibiotics. The only culture that came back in this latter period where he had the worsening of the nodular process was a sputum that showed pseudomonas aeruginosa, and you can see it's susceptible to piptazo, although it does have a pretty high MIC to piptazo, so it's sort of right on the border. And cefepime, and it's resistant to a few other things that he wasn't receiving. So, again, busy slide, summarizing all the things that I just had on the previous slides. But I just want to highlight, here's again his temperature curve over this period of time, and the yellow is his white blood cell count. And you can see most of the time when he's neutropenic, he's febrile. So there is this pretty nice correlation, except maybe over here. And this is where he had that little bit of recovery of his neutrophil count above 100, and he was able to go to the ward and be extubated, but then he got sick again pretty much after that. So what's the point here? Okay. All right. You can see that there's often a correlation with the white blood cell count and the temperature. Okay? And that goes into my thinking about neutropenic fever. When you're neutropenic, you can have fever, and it isn't always an infection. So this patient, despite being on many, many appropriate antibiotic and antifungal agents, continued to have fever and continued to have worsening. And so we also have to think about, you know, what were some of the other underlying reasons why this patient could have fever? He has leukemia, clearly. His bone marrow is full of blasts. He perhaps had septic emboli or pulmonary infarcts. We're not really sure what these things are because at this point no one was willing to do a tissue, get a tissue diagnosis for him just because of his overall clinical status. He could have had pneumonitis without infection. This is often seen, especially in patients who've had pneumonia with ARDS. You know, in that organizing phase of ARDS, you can see 
fevers, and, and it isn't necessarily due to an untreated infection. And then there's that always that underlying question that we have in these patients, are the methods that we have to diagnose infection just inadequate to find the infection, and is there something that we're missing where we have to go further in our diagnostic modalities? So I thought this was a good case to tell you a little bit about this uh, serum galactamannan test that's available, and then compare it to another serum test in which we measure another fungal uh, cell wall product in the serum, uh, and, and just kind of compare and contrast these two tests, their utility, what scenario you might consider using them in. So this was a study um, that actually did compare these these tests, these were all patients with hematologic malignancies of various kinds, solid tumors, some had bone marrow transplants, um, some had leukemias, um, all of them had, were on some kind of antifungal therapy during the course of their treatment. They were all neutropenic, um, so pretty much evenly divided. Um, and you had about 22 patients with aspergillosis, documented aspergillosis infection, 23 with some kind of candida species, and then 17 with other mold infections like fusarium or Skediosporum, um, different, different types of molds that you can pick up in blood culture. So what was interesting to me is that galactamannan is actually a test that is thought to be very specific for aspergillus. And the the 1,3-D glucan test was something that I had also always associated with uh, candida. But it turns out that all fungi make the beta 1,3-D glucan. Um, the aspergillus is the only one that makes the galactamannan, so that, that is correct. But you can actually see the 1,3-D glucan coming from aspergillus as well. And if you look at the performance of the test, um, in the patients, this is... So every patient basically um, had a documented infection. During the first two weeks of their fungal infection, while neutropenic, they had two blood samples drawn. And then a blood sample was drawn for one, one time per week for the next 12 weeks. So we have a series of samples for each patient, and that's why the sample number is so much greater than the patient number. So you had 112 sam or, sorry, 116 samples where there's aspergillosis, and they ran both assays on them. And you can see, for the aspergillus, there's, a, there's quite a difference in the sensitivity of these two tests. So the galactamannan test, which we normally think is a better test for, for aspergillus, actually didn't perform as well as the beta-1,3-D glucan. And, but it is a more specific test, as it turns out. Um, and then if you look at the negative predictive value, the negative predictive value of the beta-glucan is a little bit better than it is for the uh, galactamannan test. For candidemia, it's clear that the, the beta-1,3-D-glucan test performs better than the galactamannan test. And then for the other molds, um, it also performs better. I'm going to just switch to this slide. It turns out that... Um, the galactamannan test, the, the reason it didn't perform as well up here is that it's not very good for one of the more common species of aspergillus, which is aspergillus fumigatus. It actually turns out it's much more uh, specific test for the non-fumigatus aspergillus species, which represented, you know, what, a third, or a third or a half of the samples that they had. So if you, if you just look at it in that way, the beta-glucan test for these aspergillus species actually has a much higher, uh, sorry, for the fumigata species, has a much higher sensitivity than the galactamannan test. So down the road, we may consider using this beta-1,3-D glucan test in lieu of the galactamannan test in our patient. So if you recall, this patient had a serum galactamannan test that was negative, that was sent uh, pretty late in his course, um, and he had already been receiving voriconazole uh, therapy, which should be active against uh, these aspergillus species, no matter what it is. And you can see, though, that the negative predictive value 
is not 100%. So even though the test was negative, the patient could clearly still have had some kind of an aspergillus infection. And, you know, the fact that the test didn't come back quickly enough to make it clinically useful in terms of decision making about antifungal agents, he ended up staying on the voriconazole despite the test being negative. So this is, you know, again, just an example of maybe something down the road that we can use to help us when we can't get good samples from the lung, we can't culture these organisms very effectively out of the bloodstream. Aspergillus, as a matter of fact, really doesn't grow in blood cultures at all. So it has to come from tissue or BAL, typically. So this is something, two tests, and, you know, my thinking now is that I would really favor the latter test. So the galactamannan and the beta-1,3-D glucan are examples of tests that we can run on serum where we don't have to do culture. And in the real world, if your laboratory is able to do these tests in-house and run them quickly, you could have sort of real-time information back to you about whether a patient has an infection or not and, you know, apply that to all the other clinical diagnostic things that you're doing to make decisions about how you want to treat the patient. And so some of the examples of things that we have that we can get back very quickly are the C. difficile antigen test, which we use all the time. And now we have a test where we can actually run one test as a screening test and then do PCR for the toxin for these toxigenic strains. And it's a very good test with very high sensitivity and specificity. And you can be pretty confident that your patient doesn't have C. diff as the cause of their fever if it comes back negative. We also have other examples like an HIV rapid test, not so much in the setting of acute HIV infection, but perhaps in someone who has an unrecognized HIV infection that presents with fever and different manifestations that you think might be infectious. We have rapid antigen panels for influenza, for example. We have tests, rapid tests for HSV, herpes simplex virus. We can do urine antigen tests. Typically these are send-out tests, so we don't get them back very quickly. But again, if you could do them in-house, they could give you a clue as to whether a patient might have a Legionella infection or a histoplasma infection in the lung. Serum cryptococcal antigen, a urine pneumococcal antigen, and then some PCR methods that are becoming more and more common in hospitals. And this is just a table showing you a list of all the different tests that are now available to do PCR to detect MRSA in patient samples. So there's a wide variety of tests, all with very high sensitivities and specificities. You'll notice most of the sample types that are listed here are from the nose or the sputum or perineum rectum, because the main application for these rapid PCR methods currently is to find patients who are colonized with MRSA in hospitals and either to institute appropriate infection control situations for them or in some countries to actually then administer antibiotic therapy to try to eradicate colonization with this particular organism. But you can envision if you can do PCR on a nose swab, you could probably do PCR on blood and use these kinds of methods to actually do rapid detection of pathogens in blood as opposed to waiting for a blood culture. And as a matter of fact, there is a SEPTI test that's available in Europe now where they can do PCR on blood and look for specific, you know, with different primers, look for specific pathogens in blood samples. And they've done some correlation with culture results, which are still the gold standard. And they have, you know, sort of sensitivities in about the high 80s to 90 percent range. So that may be coming down the pike as an adjunct to the traditional culture methods that take so long, several days in most cases. Another PCR methodology, this is actually an instrument that we have at the VA hospital in the infectious disease laboratory area. 
Um, this is a, a, an instrument that actually will take any kind of patient sample, sputum, blood, um, CSF, uh, stool, and you can apply uh, these proprietary uh, primer packages that are provided by this company, uh, Tiger Technologies, and there's PCR performed directly on these patient samples, so you don't have to subculture anything out. And then there's a mass spectrometric method that actually will identify the sequence of the PCR fragments that you amplify in your sample. And then there's a very um, sophisticated algorithm that tells you what bacteria, what viruses are potentially present in your patient sample. So this is something that's being beta tested mainly for MRSA now because it's, it's an easier system. Uh, there's a, a defined, very defined set of primers that you have to use. But this is, again, something down the road that uh, a lot of clinical micro labs may be able to implement in order to do more rapid diagnostics on, directly on patient samples without waiting, having to wait uh, for the culture results to come back. Um, and then sort of not, not um, direct evidence of a, uh, of a specific pathogen, but biomarkers of infection. And I'm just going to talk about procalcitonin as my last topic here. Procalcitonin is actually a pro-peptide. Uh, it's a, a peptide precursor of calcitonin, which is a hormone involved in calcium homeostasis that's synthesized by the C cells in the thyroid as well as neuroendocrine tissues in the lung and the GI tract. And it had been observed that procalcitonin levels actually rise when patients have bacterial infections, particularly when they are in the lung or in the abdomen. And uh, what's interesting is that calcitonin doesn't rise as a consequence of the rise in the procalcitonin levels. And uh, in addition, other types of infections like viral infections and other causes of inflammation don't cause procalcitonin to increase. So it's actually kind of an in interesting biomarker that's very specific to bacterial infections um, and can be used to, to do a little bit of clinical decision making. And actually in Europe there have been some different trials looking at um, acute respiratory tract infections, bronchitis, and pneumonia, um, looking at the role of specific procalcitonin levels in terms of, you know, are we going to admit this patient? Are we going to initiate antibiotic therapy? Are we going to stop antibiotic therapy? And they were actually able to show that they could reduce the uh, initiation of antibiotics by about, by about 44% in an outpatient setting, 40% um, in bronchitis, and about 14% in pneumonia. And they were also able to reduce uh, the duration of antibiotics in, in the situation of pneumonia by, by a week to two weeks, uh, depending on the particular procalcitonin level that was returned in the individual patient. They also saw that there was a reduction in the rates of hospitalization, and there were um, fewer adverse events related to antibiotic therapy. So that's just sort of a summary of their application of procalcitonin. And this, this very pretty but busy slide just shows you a variety of different biomarkers. For example, this is CRP. Um, this is the white count. So these are just sort of the box and whisker uh, ranges that you see in individual patients that are graded by their pneumonia severity class. So these patients all have pneumonia. The most severe is class 5. The least severe is class 1. And you can see that CRP, white count, um, which is this one? I think this is just like looking at the patient, basically. Uh, I think there's ferritin is on here somewhere. But many of these markers of inflammation are elevated across the board. It doesn't really tell you much about how severe the patient's pneumonia is. But there are a few, and the, the uh, procalcitonin is shown here, where when you have a patient that has very severe bacterial pneumonia, there's a tremendous increase in the procalcitonin level. And so this is, again, just an illustration of how this particular biomarker might be used in order to determine who needs antibiotics, for how long do they need the antibiotics, are they responding to therapy. Okay. 
So just to conclude, I hope by now that I've convinced you that not all fever is infectious. There are many, many clinical entities that we see in patients that can give rise to fever. So always keep those in the back of your mind when a patient in the hospital presents with fever. Um, the only thing we have today is careful clinical evaluation and trying to make sense of kind of what kinds of treatments the patient has received, how the patient, you know, was evaluated to determine the source of fever, um, and, and then using your best clinical judgment. That's unfortunately where we are. That's our state of the art. Um, oops. We always have to consider these in the differential and evaluate accordingly. I think these are often a diagnosis, non-infectious causes are a diagnosis of exclusion, for example, with drug fever, but they may also be a diagnosis of inclusion. If you find another reason that a patient has a fever, um, it's often safe to stop treating them for a presumptive infection and treat the other thing, like gout, for example. Um, we can have infections and non-infectious causes present in the same patient, and that, that was shown in many of the examples today. And I think it's always prudent, if, if you think you've treated the patient appropriately for an infection that you think you've identified in a, in a clinical sense, if, if you've given them enough antibiotics, it's okay to stop, um, especially if the patient is remaining in the hospital and is febrile. You can evaluate the patient clinically, reculture off the antibiotics, just kind of start the process again to look to see if there is truly an infectious cause, and if not, look for other reasons why the patient is having a fever. Thank you.